to section five. All right, and this goes to question three. Why did human sacrifice end in China? No one asked question two, but I need to review it very briefly. I'm not answering the whole thing, but just so we understand three, why did human sacrifice end in China? So you may remember we watched the video clip about the making of iron weapons. And you remember what kind of weapons were they making? Crossbows. They were making crossbows, right? And crossbows were very easy to learn to use, right? They said it only took a few days to teach peasants how to use crossbows. And these crossbows could be, were made of iron with iron uh, quarrels, so they were very cheap. I remember it was very cheap uh, compared to other metals. And so you could make huge armies. You could make, make mass armies. You know, put together, you have Sun Tzu's ideas that we can train anyone to be a soldier. And then we've got cheap weapons. So now we can produce gigantic armies. And if you want to unite a gigantic country like China, you need a big army. You can't unite a big country like China with a few thousand chariots. You need armies of hundreds of thousands of men. And you can get that when you can train peasants how to use crossbows. Just takes a few days, boom, you've got your army. So that, but you may say, well, what does that have to do with the ending of human sacrifice? Remember, Shi Huang Di, when he was buried, his tomb did not have people sacrificed with him, right? Remember we talked about Lady Hao. She had people who had been sacrificed with her, not Shi Huang Di. He had the terracotta warriors. Right? He had thousands of these guys meant to defend him in the afterlife. The reason why he switches, in a sense, and this shift happens, is because human life, ironically, because of war, is too valuable to just sacrifice. You, have the, you need all these people to be in your army. When you're raising an army of hundreds of thousands of soldiers, you can't just throw away lives by sacrificing people. Right? When you want to feed an army made up of hundreds of thousands of soldiers... Again, you cannot uh, waste lives by sacrificing people because that means you don't have farmers to feed your big army. So ironically, the demands of war to have big armies and lots of farmers to feed those big armies meant human life was too precious to sacrifice. Uh, the next question, what did the Qin Emperor, and this is just so you know, the Qin Emperor, Shi Huangdi, is the same person. Shi Huangdi is the Qin Emperor. Need to overcome the problems that caused the fall of the Zhou. How did he try and do that? Remember, the Zhou dynasty had followed this system of feudalism. Right? Remember, the, the Zhou emperor, or I'm sorry, not Zhou emperor, the Zhou king, uh, Shi Huangdi is the first emperor. The Zhou king gave aristocrats land, and in return, they gave him military servants. Remember, I gave you the examples, you know, I, I think I picked on Sid and Cameron. Uh, if I recall correctly, I said, you guys get some land, and you owe me chariots when I want them. The problem is, remember, over time, that system uh, doesn't work because, you know, their grandkids are not going to be loyal to my grandkids, and they're going to use the chariots to attack each other or to attack me, right? You've lost power. So he doesn't like, so Xi Huangdi does not like that system, right? He doesn't want that. He wants a stronger government, right? One that gives him more control so people can't overthrow him. So like the Zhou... Xi Huangdi had to have people in his government who were loyal and competent, but they had to be too weak to overthrow him. He had to figure out a way to find people who could do their jobs well and who would be loyal, but could never overthrow him, right? Who would be too weak to do so, right? So I may trust these people to give them land and um, so forth, and they, they raise their own armies that are supposed to serve me, but in the end, they could overthrow me if they chose to do so, and that's essentially what happens to the Joe Kings. So his way of fixing that is moving from, I'm sorry, the way he deals with this is he shifts to bureaucracy. He moves from feudalism to a centralized government with a bureaucracy. You may say, what's a bureaucracy? <laughs> well, I say, bureaucracy, you have less aristocrats, people who have power because of their parents, because of birth, towards government officials. You may say, okay, well, that's great. Well, what's the difference between an aristocrat and a government official? Well, remember, the aristocrats are given land, right? The aristocrats were given land and told to raise armies from their land. Government officials are paid a salary. You can't fire an aristocrat. They hold that land. If you try and fire them, they've got chariots. They'll fight you. The government official, they don't do their job, you can fire them. They have to stay loyal if they want to keep getting paid their salary. And their positions are not hereditary. So government officials are paid a salary and their positions are not hereditary. They don't get to pass them on to their kids. So you can get rid of them if you don't like them. And that means they have to be loyal to you if they want to keep their jobs. 
In contrast, the aristocrats, you know, they've got their own resources, they've got their own farms, they can rebel if they want. Right? So they're less, aristocrats are less dependent on you, that is why Shi Huangdi moves away from them towards government officials who are paid salaries, not given land, and who do not have hereditary positions. Now, what changes did Shi Huangdi bring in terms of taxes? What did he standardize? What government style did he follow? So remember, he's going to change the tax structure. Instead of having like the system where you have the aristocrats who are supposed to raise the army, meaning the armies are loyal to them because they pay the armies, in his system, you tax the people and the land directly. Right? You tax the people and the land directly, and that gives you the taxes, and then you pay the army, and the army is loyal to you. So Xi Huangdi gets the tax directly, the taxes go into his pocket, he pays them out to the army, the army will stay loyal to him. In addition, he's going to engage in standardization. People were starting to write Chinese characters differently, depending on different regions. He said, nope, this is the way you got to write them. He standardized measurements to make it easier to trade. Right? You could, uh, all throughout China, they started using the exact same measurements. That makes it easier to collect taxes and easier to trade. And he even standardized the roads to make it easier for people to travel. Now, the last question was government style. Remember, he's the guy that his own mom tried to kill him. So he didn't like Confucianism. Remember, Confucius taught that people are basically good, and that if we just listen to the right kinds of music and perform correct rituals, we'll become moral, and we should like love, honor, and respect our parents. Xi Huangdi hated that system. He said, this doesn't make any idea. He actually killed a bunch of, about 400 Confucian scholars by burying them alive. He hated their ideas so much. He followed legalism, which said people are basically bad, and we need to be beaten into obedience. We need to have strict laws and punishments. That's the only way we can deal with them. Yes, Cameron. Oh, wasn't he the one that built the Great Wall? Yes, exactly. Yeah, he also built the Great Wall. Yeah, very good. No one had any question on these questions from Section 5? We did have some questions here. Uh, so who were Taizong and Zhuangzong? What does their relationship tell us about Tang China? So remember, Zhuangzong was a Buddhist monk. Right? Zhuangzong was a Buddhist monk. Taizong was a Tang emperor. Right? Taizong was a Tang emperor. Remember, Taizong gave money and supported Xuanzang so he could translate books, Buddhist books, from Sanskrit, which is an Indian language, into Chinese. Right, so the Taizong Emperor is supporting the translation project of this Buddhist monk of these texts, right, from Sanskrit, Indian language, into Chinese, so Chinese people could better understand Buddhism. And remember, Taizong had this idea that culture helps us rule, that the government should sponsor culture. That makes the government look good, because it sponsors people, things that people like, that people are impressed by. Right? Uh, Buddhism, we'll talk about, did some things that Chinese religion didn't normally do, so Chinese people were impressed by it. They thought Buddhism was a good thing, so they like him because he supports it. But also, it makes Chinese people proud of being Chinese people. Look at this wonderful culture of ours. Isn't it great? And that means that people are going to be willing to sacrifice for their culture, for their civilization. Right? If we're proud of ourselves, we're proud of our civilization and culture, we're willing to work hard to maintain it, even if it costs us something. So that's kind of the overall lesson there. How did Buddhism get to China? Why was Buddhism attracted to some people living in China? How might it change in China? Well, it came on the Silk Road. Remember, the Silk Road was a system of roads called the Silk Road because silk was the main thing traded on it. Right? And... Um, not only did these goods travel, ideas travel. And so Buddhism is going to come into China through the Silk Road. That's how they get exposed to it. And it's attractive to Chinese people for many reasons, but one of the key things is this. Our Confucianism tells you how to be good. But it doesn't tell you how to make sense of suffering. It doesn't tell you what happens to you after you die. It doesn't do any of those things. But Buddhism does. Buddhism promises enlightenment and salvation things that are missing in Confucianism. So many Chinese people were attracted to it. Now, one example of how Buddhism will change, though, you can see in uh, the Buddha you sometimes see at Chinese restaurants. This is Maitreya, the laughing Buddha. Uh, I'm sorry, the future Buddha. He's always laughing and smiling. That's why I called him that. But he's also called the future Buddha. Buddhists believe that there'll be, uh, Buddhism will be kind of forgotten, and a new Buddha will have to come and teach it to people again. Right. So that's what he does, and he exists in traditional... Hindu Buddhism, or traditional Indian Buddhism, rather, what makes him different is you won't see this kind of statue to him 
in Indian Buddhism. This is Chinese Buddhism. He's kind of chubby, he's kind of big. And that's to show that in the future things will be good. Right? When the Buddha, Buddha law comes back, we will all live much better, much happier lives. That's the idea there. Yes, Sid? So the future of Buddha exists in both Indian and Chinese Buddhism? Yeah, the Chinese got him from India. But you won't see this representation. So they adapt it. Right, for, from the Chinese perspective, you know, this idea, okay, there's going to be a future Buddha, he'll come, things will be better, so we should make him chubby to show that we'll all have enough food to eat. That, that's the basic idea. What were the characteristics of religion during the early part of the Tang dynasty? So one thing as we've talked about so far was that the, the Tang supported Buddhism, right? We saw that in the case of Taizong and Zhuanzang. Oh, please come in, Dr. Richardson. Um, let me just pause this for a second. So we had this question, right, what were the characteristics of religion during the early part of the Tang Dynasty? And so as we already talked about, right, you've got Buddhism is being supported, right? The Taizong Emperor thinks Buddhism is a good thing. Uh, he's supporting it. And there's a lot of reasons why. One is, of course, like we already said, culture, this idea that will help him to rule and keep the Chinese together. This idea, of course, that enlightenment is a good thing. We want to encourage that. Buddhist monks were expected to pray for the good of the government, Right? The, uh, in Chinese Buddhism, the Buddhas are seen as powerful gods and spirits, kind of. And if you pray to them, they will protect your country. And also there was this idea of unifying China. But here's what I have to emphasize. Remember, the Tang is this dynasty that's really, really open to the outside world. And so even though Buddhism is kind of a state-supported religion, that did not mean that they excluded other religion. There is an Islamic presence in China that will spread. Right, so Islam is present in China, and also Christianity will spread in this early part of China. Um, it, this Christian community will eventually kind of fall apart, but they are allowed to exist, and in fact, they get government support. Right? Remember I talked about there was a Syrian monk, right? this, cat, this uh, missionary who comes all the way from Syria um, to China, and he will receive government support and will build this monument, when you'll see there's a little cross on top. So you do have this friendliness towards outside religion, at least at first. Yeah, Tasha. So it wasn't like that in the Zhou Dynasty? Well, Zhou Dynasty is pre-Christian. Uh, they were, and they, they, Buddhism had not yet got to China, so they weren't having to deal with other religions. But good question, yeah. Other, they, there were no other real religions they were encountering at that time. So now what kind of changes that is this thing called the An Lushan Rebellion. So this next question was, what was the An Lushan Rebellion? What caused it? How was it put down? What impact did it have on the governments of the Tang Dynasty, its relationship with foreign religions? So our An Lushan Rebellion, An Lushan was a person. He's connected with China, but remember, he's not Chinese. He was probably Turkish. Remember, the Tang Dynasty was very open to allowing foreigners to serve in its governments. So they were fine with that. Now... The other person this focuses on this woman named Yang Weifei, right? The, she was the concubine, the courtesan of an emperor. I remember that emperor. One reason I don't care about you know his name is he himself was not that important because he gave power over to Yang Weifei, right? He let her make a lot of the decisions, and she tended, unfortunately, to just give positions of power and make decisions to benefit people who were nice to her, who flattered her, or were her family members, or her people she liked. For example, like An Lushan. And so they're not doing a good job being officials, even though China is at a time where it needs good officials. So he is going to um, decide, hey, the emperor's weak, uh, on the Shan, is going to decide, hey, the emperor's weak, maybe I should just take power myself. And he leads a massive rebellion against the emperor. It's only put down with the help of a group of people called Uyghurs, who are uh, Muslim, I think they're Muslims by this time, they're Muslims now in China, but they help put this down. So he can't put down the rebellion himself. Right? He needs outside help. So this will weaken the Tong. It will struggle on for another 150 years, but it will eventually fall. Now, you may remember we watched a poem about, or we watched like a video about this, and they had this poem where they said that the state is gone, but the land remains. It means, you know, our government has fallen apart, but the country of China is still here. We can put it back together again. But the key thing is when they put it back together again, they say, you know what? These foreigners are trouble. Right? This An Lushan guy, we trusted him, and he led a rebellion. We need to turn away from the outside world back to Chinese tradition. And this will be when they turn away from this tolerant attitude towards for foreign religions. For example, Buddhism will stop receiving that state support, and the government will actually put lots of restrictions on Buddhism. And this is when you'll have like a collapse in the Christian community. They don't really go too far after the Christians, but there's not even that many of them. So there's going to be an anti-foreign turn, right? Turning away from Buddhism 
and from foreign ideas inward towards, back towards Confucianism and ideas like that. And one student, uh, by the way, Zhang Nu will not be on the test. That's something I removed and I apologize. I forgot to take it off of the study guide. So that will not be on the exam. Chang An will, though. And the student did ask about Chang An. So remember, Chang An was the capital of Tang Dynasty. Right, so the capital of the dynasty was Chang An. Remember, it had this very well laid out, harmonious kind of uh, archi or, uh, structure. Remember, you can like fold, if you took a map, you could like fold it in half, and it has all these nice north, south, east, west lines. Emperor sits in the north, faces south. The J Japanese, especially this guy, Prince Shotoku, thought it was so cool that they would make their capital copy the Chinese capital. Right. Now, I, that's one reason I talked a lot about this capital, because you see other people copying it. And I use that to show the influence of Chinese culture. Now, no one asked this question, but I'm still going to go over it very briefly, because this is the perfect time to. Remember, Japan and Korea will borrow Chinese culture and civilization. It's very advanced. It's beyond what they had at the Chinese, or what the Japanese and Koreans had at the time. So they'll borrow Chinese civilization, but they do not want to be controlled by China. Right? They want to borrow from China, but they want to maintain their political independence. 